Namaste. Danielle is asking some very good questions. And so I'm going to reply to them at length in the series of videos. <laughs> some questions are just so good and so deep that you, you can't just give a one sentence answer. Uh, so the first question is basically, why do we need religion? If the idea is to get rid of all mental structures and attain self-realization, then why do we need to believe in this whole framework of gods and goddesses and all this stuff? Well, <laughs> first of all, most likely in the West, all you have known is a corrupt, degenerate religion. You have never known a real religion. What do I mean by a real religion? One that works. <laughs> You know, like one pill makes you larger, one pill makes you small, but the one that mothers gives gives you don't do anything at all. Why is that? Because in the West, the religion has been based on duality only. And in duality, of course, there is no such thing as self-realization and there is no link, no pathway to self-realization from duality. So that's your first disadvantage, is that you've been raised in a dualistic culture with a corrupt religion. And the other thing is you've been indoctrinated in school for 12 years or more in this mechanistic, reductionistic materialism, which says that the universe is this thing out there with all these objects in it, huh? and that it exists independently, huh? it has its own separate existence, and it goes on and on. This is all completely wrong. So you're bringing these attitudes and these mental structures, the conditioning, that you were given by the society into the realm of self-realization based on non-duality. And what happens is, first of all, you miss the significance of the religious part, karma yoga and bhakti yoga. Okay, karma yoga and bhakti yoga psychologically or uh, on a scale of consciousness would be roughly equivalent to the Buddha's first four jhanas, the material jhanas. And Raja Yoga and Jnana Yoga would be roughly equivalent to the four higher jhanas of the Buddha, the immaterial jhanas or stages of meditation, mind bases literally, ontological structures. Why do we need an ontological structure? To make sense of things. To make sense of the universe. We cannot attain freedom from duality. We cannot attain silence of the mind without a structure that permits it. And in Western culture, that structure doesn't exist. All the structures tell us, no, it's impossible. You're crazy. <laughs> Give it up. <laughs> it's just a myth, isn't it? So, okay, let's explain it structurally. Maybe that will help. The one self, the non-dual self, I want to use the word emanate, but that's not quite correct. Well, let's just say he emanates the material creation, projects the creation. I'm not even going to call it material because it's not only material. <laughs> and he himself is all that creation is made of because he is everything and all that is. So... 
him being unconditioned self-awareness, unlimited, eternal, being, he infuses the projections, that's the right word, of the material objects and space and so forth with his being. Therefore, the whole creation is based on and pervaded by consciousness. Not, all, not all ordinary consciousness, absolute consciousness. Mm -hmm. Self-consciousness, awareness of awareness. So that being the case, in order to regulate and control and also enjoy this creation, the Absolute manifests certain uh, beings in it. These are called avatars, incarnations, gods, goddesses. These different forms well, it's described in the scripture of Srimad Bhagavatam. They're called scheduled incarnations for specific functions. Each one of them has a specific function in the creation, maintenance, or dissolution of the universe. So, the universe is like a story. It always has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Time always has past, present, and future, and so on. It's not really a duality. It's more like a trinity or a triplicity. Huh? We pointed that out in our earlier ontological studies as well. So we have always find this trinity at the basis of existence because existence requires trinitarian relationship of subject, object, and relation. That's the essence of meaning. So to find release from duality, one must have a structure of meaning that contains the key to that release. Now, generally, these keys are encrypted within a symbolic language. And that symbolic language is a language of being. Okay? So, all right. The self incarnates in these automatically self-realized forms with great powers. And so by worshiping those forms for specific results, one gradually comes to identify with those beings and gain control over or influence over their powers to some greater or lesser extent. See, the uh, mechanistic paradigm does not explain life, does it? The mechanistic paradigm is great for inventing gadgets that work under very specialized narrow range of circumstances. But it's not very good for dealing with life, is it? That's why you're unhappy. That's why you're searching. That's why you're looking for higher knowledge. Because what you were given is completely inadequate to deal with actual life. What we need is magic. And religion gives us the tools of magic, ceremonial magic. Huh? This is not, I mean, Vedic religion is not a, a, a caricature of a religion like the Western religions. The Western religions are like parodies of religion. Huh? Real religion gives you some power. It, you get some skin in the game. You get to influence what happens. Huh? You get to talk to the man. And if you convince him, he'll give you whatever you want. So try to understand. Vedic religion is not just like playing with dolls. It's deep, powerful, ceremonial magic. I'd love to tell you about my personal 
ceremonial magic. Huh? But it's like, uh, this is a family show. <laughs> I don't know who's watching these videos. So I can't say much about it because it's definitely like adult, adult uh, content. <laughs> but just like you have to find one meditation object on which your mind can easily fix itself in order to attain samadhi. This object has to be something you love, has to be something you find pleasurable. Otherwise, you will not be able to fix the mind by force. The mind is made of mercury, quicksilver. You touch it and it just scatters. So you try to force the mind. It's like herding cats. <laughs> No, you have to have, attract the mind to something beautiful. Now, these gods and goddesses are also very beautiful. They have all good qualities. Huh? And the difference between a corrupt, degenerate religion and a living religion is that the living religion also has a path that leads to authentic self-realization. So, in other words, the worship of gods and goddesses uh, in Vedic religion, especially on the advanced spontaneous platform, is a vast field for personal creativity, development of great power and skill, leading to ultimate freedom from all qualities. But to see how that's linked together is a, a very long, detailed explanation. Put it this way. God is the self. And you and I are also the self. There is nothing but the self. Everything is the self. Just incarnated or projected, self-projected in different forms. And these forms are always changing, always moving, isn't it? So, we can't control those forms directly. We're not empowered to do that. Me, I, we meaning the I, the ego, the mind, the personality, the false identity. But as the real identity, as the self itself, we can, over time, by training, identify with and assume a lot of the qualities of these gods. And that is how we get the intelligence. That is how we get the power to become self-realized. Huh? Because it's beyond human power, I keep saying. Let, let Kundalini exist, and let Krishna exist, and Shiva, and Ganesh, and all of them. Narasingha, my favorite. And let us worship them according to their tastes, to their desires. We will find the form of God that is most compatible with our own tastes and desires. And we worship that form. And what do we get from that? We get all kinds of material benefits. Because these forms are how the self manages the material creation. So if we please them, all kinds of good things come. Of course, you have to know what to ask for. You can get yourself in some real trouble. <laughs> but if you ask for the right things, if you ask for illumination, self-realization, release, moksha, well, like I worship Ganapati every day, please take away all the uh, obstructions to my complete self-realization. I don't want anything else. So in that way, one clears the path of obstacles and removes the so much bad karma. You have no idea, you know, just the karma from meat eating while you were a kid in school and didn't know any better, you know, is going to hold you back. It's going to block you from self-realization unless you have a way to remove it. And that's another benefit of religion and worship that most people aren't aware of. But we need it. And without real religion, 
there can't be self-realization. Because religion provides the conceptual basis, uh, the Vedanta, the Buddha Sutras, all the Advaita scriptures, the wonderful, rich heritage uh, taught by Ramana Maharshi and others, right? Shankaracharya, uh, all these wonderful Advaita breakthroughs were written on the background or the basis of Vedic religion. And Shankaracharya himself went all over India establishing temples. Temples of God. Krishna, Shiva, Uma, Parvati, Ganesh, and many others. So if Adi Shankaracharya was establishing temples and giving instruction and writing poems about bhakti, then shouldn't we give it a look? I mean, I can recommend sources of information that give the correct perspective on bhakti and karma yoga. We'll get to karma yoga <laughs> because you've all got that wrong too. So... Uh, this is going to be a couple of videos, two or three, maybe, I don't know, just to answer these questions, uh, because I think they're very worthwhile questions that we should address. Om Tat Sat, Om Harihi Om.